comme disait Churchill, attention, je vais parler français. Moi, je dis attention, je vais parler anglais. Dear Jeremy Rifkin, uh, let me tell you how pleased we are to have you here today. As I was saying, you're not just uh, a thinker, but also a player. By this, I mean uh, you want to make things change. Uh, you want to help uh, governments, big institutions, uh, to adapt to what you, called, you call the third industrial revolution. Reading your last book, uh, it's quite obvious that you feel passionate about all the, the, the opportunities uh, shown by the sharing economy. True to your word, tonight you're going to share with us your ideas, your innovative thoughts, and uh, it's, precisely, it's uh, precisely what you're going to do tonight. Uh, you're going to speak about the Internet of Objects, the future of food, and the third industrial revolution. Once again, Jeremy Rifkin, thank you so much for being here. And it's my great pleasure to tell you the floor is yours. We can put the water right here, I think. Good evening, everybody. It's always a pleasure to be in France, especially this time of the year. Just beautiful. A quick note. If you have cameras, you need to go to the back of the room. You can take one photo. I'm used to a classroom, nice and quiet. Cell phones off. Don't put the iPads up. Okay? All right. GDP... GDP is slowing all over the world, every country. Productivity is slowing all over the world, every country. Unemployment is stubbornly high all over the world, every country. We're beginning to glimpse the long sunset of one of the great economic eras in world history. But we're also beginning to see the sunrise of a completely new economic paradigm that's going to change the way we live on this planet. To understand the crisis and the opportunity, we need to understand how the great paradigm shifts occur in economic history. That's going to give us a road map for what the food industry and every other industry needs to do to bring us on a new journey. We have to relearn how to live on this earth. When we look at the great economic paradigm shifts in history, they share a common denominator. And that is, at a certain period of time, three defining technologies emerge and converge to create what we call in engineering a general purpose technology platform. That's a fancy way of saying a new infrastructure for organizing economic life. What are the three defining technologies? And from here on in, I want you to think of your industry and everything I'm saying, the food industry, from the agricultural fields to the final end user. Here are the three technologies that come together and change economic history. New communication technologies to more efficiently manage economic activity new sources of energy to more efficiently power economic activity, and new modes of transportation and logistics to more efficiently move economic activity. Every economic value chain in history is about managing, powering, and moving economic life. You'll have to put the camera in the back. You have to go in the back. Thanks. Let me give you an example. First Industrial Revolution, 19th century, Britain. The Brits moved us from manual printing presses, Gutenberg, 
to steam-powered printing, big leap forward in managing more efficient communication. Then the Brits laid down the telegraph. These communication technologies then converged with cheap coal in Britain, and they used that as an energy source with a new invention, a British invention, the steam engine. Then they put the steam engine on rails, locomotives, national rail systems, the first national market economy, industrial capitalism. 20th century, second industrial revolution, United States. Centralized electricity, Edison. Allowed Alexander Graham Bell to lay out the telephone system. Later, radio and television. These communication technologies converged with cheap Texas oil, powered by a German invention, the internal combustion engine. Then Henry Ford put us all on roads and wheels, cars, buses and trucks, continental road systems, communication, energy, transport and logistics, a new matrix. The second industrial revolution took us through the 20th century. It peaked in July of 2008 when Brent crude oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets, a record peak in oil price. And when that happened in July of 2008, you'll recall here in your industry, the prices for everything that we were buying in the stores went through the roof because everything is made out of or moved by fossil fuels in the second industrial revolution. Our fertilizers, our pesticides, our fossil fuels. When the price goes up, their price goes up. Our construction materials are made out of fossil fuels. Most of our pharmaceutical products are made out of fossil fuels. Our synthetic fiber, our power, our transport, our heat and lights, all made out of fossil fuels. So when the price of oil starts to move over 100 a barrel, all the other prices go up. At 147 a barrel, purchasing power shut down in July 2008. That was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. We are now not only in the Great Recession, but we are in the early stages of a very, very long end game for the second industrial revolution based on centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel and nuclear energy, internal combustion transport on dumb road and rail systems, and this affects every single industry, none more than food processing from the agricultural fields to the final end user. Let me share an anecdote. When Angela Merkel became chancellor of Germany, 2005, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first few weeks of her new government to help her address the question, how do we grow the German economy? When I got to Berlin, the first question I asked the chancellor, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy, the EU economy, the global economy, in the last stages of a great industrial revolution where the centralized telecommunications, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion and transport has now matured, optimized its productivity potential. We can't get anything more out of the platform. It doesn't make any difference whether you're in China or Senegal or the United States or France. Any country still operating on that platform in the next 20 years cannot move their economy. You can have austerity, you can have labor market reforms and fiscal reforms, fine, but it's the platform, the infrastructure we're plugging into from food to manufacturing to every other industry, there's no more aggregate efficiency left on that platform. That's why productivity is failing. So that day, the first day I met with the chancellor, I laid out this third industrial revolution uh, paradigm shift. At the end of the day, over a glass of wine, she said, Jeremy, I want this for Germany. Three weeks ago, this is from 2005 to 2015, we had a meeting in Germany. We brought 61 governments there to debut the system that we are now put to place in Germany. And I'm going to tell you the next place it's going to happen is France, and they're going to join together, France and Germany. Here is the third industrial revolution. We are seeing the convergence of communication, energy, and transport again. 
to create a new matrix, a new platform for economic life. The communication revolution, the internet we all use, our smartphones, our mobiles, our laptops, the communication internet is morphing and beginning to converge with a digitalized renewable energy internet in Germany and a digitalized, automated, GPS-guided, and within 10 years, driverless transport and logistics internet to create three internets, communication internet, renewable energy internet, transport logistics internet. They are one super internet, and they create the kernel for what we call the internet of things. We are connecting sensors to every machine, every device, every appliance across the value chain. We have sensors now, as you know, in the agricultural fields, in the soil, monitoring the soil salinity and the water and the growth of the crops. Let's just trace it through your industry. We have sensors that can watch the fruit and check on its ripeness and its decay as it's traveling from the farm to the warehouse. So we know how fast we have to get that food to the store before it decays. The sensors is telling us. We have sensors in the warehouses, in the distribution centers, monitoring in real time the flow of our economic activity to the final end users. We have sensors in the grocery stores, the retail stores, monitoring how food is being taken off the shelves. We have smart homes, and the refrigerator is telling us now which foods have to be replaced because we're running short. We have sensors now even in the recycling shift. It's just beginning. Every machine is going to be talking to every other machine, but more importantly, they're going to be sending data back to this three internets, communication, energy, transport. These three internets are the brain, if you will, the collective human brain outed into technology. We're going to have 100 trillion sensors at 2030 connecting every device with every human being in one global network. Now, it's exciting because for the first time in history, we're going to democratize economic life because we're going to engage the entire human race at very low marginal cost, and everyone's going to be a social entrepreneur and a player in one way or another. At the other side of this game is the dark side. The moment we talk about connecting the human race as one economic family operating in real time with the Internet of Things, the immediate next question is, wait a minute. A hundred trillion sensors connecting every device and every human being? What about network neutrality? How do we ensure governments and certain industries don't enclose this global brain and use it for their own commercial ends? How do we ensure privacy in this totally transparent, interconnected age? How do we guarantee data security? How do we thwart cyber crime and cyber terrorism and the complete disruption of the platform around the planet? These are heavy, substantial challenges, and we're dealing with them in Brussels. I'm working with the new commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, the commission of the parliament right now on these issues. They're going to take us through three generations of political struggle, dealing with the dark side. But let's assume this evening that we can address these issues. The book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society, goes into it in detail. Here's what this gives us, the benefits. We have 3 billion people connected to the Internet right now. I just got back from China. I'm working with the leadership there on this plan. They're working with Germany and the EU. The vice premier said to me, uh, Price, uh, Vice Premier Wan Yang, he said, Jeremy, we now have a $25 smartphone in China. This means if you're making $2 a day, everyone's going to be connected in the next 10 years. Everyone. So we can go up on this emerging Internet of Things, communication, energy, and transport, everyone in this room, because it's all started, and just the cost of a service provider, very cheap, we're all going to have a transparent picture of everything going on in the economy. Even big companies didn't have this information before. This levels the playing field, democratizes economic life, because everyone's going to know everything. So here's what this means. If you're in the food processing industry, 
if you're a family, if you're a small or medium-sized enterprise, if you're in any industry. We all have a value chain in this room because we are, among other things, we are economic beings. So if you're a small business, a family, a food processor, a manufacturer, every day each of us are constantly marshalling economic activity. We're moving it along our value chain. We're producing goods and services with that economic activity. We're consuming economic activity. We're recycling economic activity. That's our value chain. We all have it every day. Here's what this means. Every one of us in this room can begin now to go up on this Internet of Things platform for a third industrial revolution and cut our swath of the value chain out and watch our data that we care about. So if you're a farmer, if you're a small and medium-sized food processor, if you're a wholesaler distributor, you can simply cut your data that you're interested in in your value chain. And then you can use your own analytics, create your own algorithms with your own apps, not rocket science, they'll all be there for you, so that in any part of the food system, you can use analytics, create the algorithms, create the apps, and dramatically increase the aggregate efficiency of every single conversion on your value chain from the agricultural field to the final end user. And by increasing your aggregate efficiencies at every step of your value chain, dramatically increase productivity. 86% of productivity is what we call aggregate efficiency, which is the ratio of potential to useful work at every step of conversion how much actually got into the product. Only 14% of productivity is better machines and workers. So what this means is that in the food industry and every other industry, increase your aggregate efficiencies at every step of conversion with big data, analytics, algorithms, and a farmer can do it at near zero marginal cost with their mobile technology. Everyone can. This allows us to dramatically increase productivity across our value chains, reduce our marginal cost. In capitalist theory, we always want to reduce marginal costs, which is the cost of producing an additional unit of a good or service after we pay the fixed cost. And in capitalist theory, the optimum market is where you sell at marginal cost. We're going to be able to dramatically reduce marginal cost in the food industry from the farmer to the end user, so you will have very low marginal cost with extreme productivity and be competitive in a very low marginal cost digital world because everyone else is going to have to do this. Some goods and services are going to become so cheap on their marginal cost that the costs are going to go to near zero. Once the marginal cost for some goods and services go to near zero marginal cost, they're no longer in the market. They're free. They're abundant. They're shareable on the new sharing economy that the millennials in this room are beginning to develop. You've been reading a lot about the sharing economy. Capitalism is giving birth to a progeny. It's called the sharing economy on the collaborative commons. This sharing economy is not simply a new addition to capitalism. It's a new economic system. Capitalism is giving birth to a progeny, a new economic system. The sharing economy is the first new economic system to enter onto the world stage since capitalism and socialism in the first half of the 19th century. So it's young, but it's a remarkable event. And the sharing economy is flourishing alongside the parent, capitalism. Now, the parent has to nurture this child Capitalism has to let it grow, let the sharing economy emerge, let it create its own identity, let it flourish. But if you're a parent, you know the child transforms the parent. In this case, capitalism is going to be fundamentally changed by this child it's given birth to. Because increasingly, it's going to be moving from simply selling one-off products and services, and increasingly, it's going to be aggregating the networks to allow the sharing economy to flourish. To the extent that capitalism can aggregate the networks, create the apps, the connectivity, 
we are going to see a hybrid economic system. It's already here. Part exchange economy, capitalism. Part sharing economy, collaborative commons. It's already here. Capitalism will still be here by mid-century. It will flourish alongside with its grown-up child, the sharing economy, now an adult. But it's not going to be the exclusive arbiter of economic life. It's going to share the stage with its grown-up child. We have already seen the impact of low to near zero marginal cost. It's devastated entire industries in 15 years, but created all sorts of new capitalist enterprises and nonprofit enterprises. The communication internet, it's been here 25 years since the World Wide Web. What's happened in the last 15 years since Napster, the music service? Some of the biggest vertically integrated industries of the 20th century gone down, all in 15 years. We now have a new category. We used to say there are sellers and buyers, there are owners and workers. They're still here, they're not going away, but now we have a new category, prosumers. And that is hundreds of millions, in fact, three billion people on the Internet have at any given time been a prosumer, every single one of you. That is, you are producing and sh consuming and or sharing goods and services with each other at near zero marginal cost. Right now, as I speak, there are millions of people around the world right now producing and sharing their own music. And whether they send that music to one person or a billion people, the cost is still near zero. They just need a service provider. We have millions of young people right now today who are producing and sharing their own YouTube videos, open source, cultural commons license, no intellectual property. And whether you share your video with one person or a billion people, it's near zero marginal cost. Producing and sharing news blogs, social media, contributing to Wikipedia. And now six million students are taking massive open online college courses taught by the best professors, the best universities, they're getting college credits near zero marginal cost. You send that course to one student or a billion, it's still near zero. Some of the biggest vertically integrated enterprises of the 20th century have plunged. The music industry has gone down. Television has shrunk. The kids are all sharing their own <laughs> videos with each other. Newspapers and magazines have gone out of business, and my new book was on Pirate Bay before it was published, and they even had it ranked before Amazon. But whole new industries have emerged. Even though these industries have gone down, we have thousands and thousands of for-profit and not-for-profit enterprises flourishing on the Internet of Things sharing economy. Not just Facebook, Google, and Twitter. There's thousands of app companies and aggregated commons companies that are all over the Internet. So what we've begun to see is the democratization of entertainment, news, and knowledge. It used to be centralized in the hands of vertically integrated companies. Now, young people are democratizing culture, education, and knowledge. But we thought there would be a firewall here and the zero marginal cost phenomena, while it affects the virtual world of bits, entertainment, news, and knowledge, it wouldn't cross the firewall to the physical world of atoms, the brick and mortar world. What I'm saying in this new book, the firewall's breached. It's called the Internet of Things, Third Industrial Revolution. When the communication internet converges with a renewable energy internet in an automated driverless transport and logistics internet, we break through the wall. We're heading to near zero marginal cost renewable energy produced by everyone on the planet within 25 years. We are heading to very low marginal cost transport and logistics on a GPS-guided car-sharing driverless transport system within less than 20 years. Let's look at energy. Germany. I mentioned it on March 26. We debuted our plan in Germany, which is now being implemented, and we had 61 governments there. Here's what we said. Germany now is moving on the energy Internet. We're 26% green electricity right now in Germany, solar and wind. We'll be 35% solar and wind before 2020. We're going to be 100% renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, and biomass by 2040. 
That's 25 years from now. The fixed cost of these renewable energies on the emerging energy Internet are on an exponential curve, just like computing. You know, when I was a kid, I'm the oldest person in this room. I'm a World War II baby. Computers cost millions of dollars. There were only a few of them. Today, we have a smartphone for $25 because of Moore's Law. We saw that Intel chip. We doubled the capacity, half the cost with computing every two years. It's an exponential curve. We're seeing the same thing with solar and wind. 20 years, exponential curve. A solar watt of electricity cost $78 to produce one watt in 1977. $78 one watt. Today, it's 36 cents one watt. You see what's happening? It's going to zero. Within the next 20 years, the harvesting technologies, they're going to be putting solar in paint. We're already doing it in paint, in glass, in facades. Your bioconverters, your geothermal heat pumps, the solar, it's going to be as cheap as your little smartphones within 20 years. The curves are not going away. And what's interesting, while the power companies say, oh, this is way off in the future, privately in Europe and America, the electricity companies are buying long-term contracts for solar and wind for 20-year contracts at $0.04 cents a kilowatt hour. They're abandoning coal and gas. They're just not talking about it publicly in nuclear because they see the curves. They're willing to do 20-year contracts at $0.04 cents a kilowatt hour. But once we pay the fixed cost of that solar and wind technology, the marginal cost of energy in Germany right now for 27% of the energy, near zero. The sun is not sending a bill over Germany. The wind isn't sending a bill over Germany. The geothermal heat's not sending a bill in Germany. Once you pay for the fixed cost, just keep the technology clean. How does any country compete with near zero once you pay for the maintenance and the fixed cost? Who's producing all this new energy? We have four major power companies in Germany, Vattenfall, EMW, RWE, and E.ON. We thought they were invincible, vertically integrated enterprises. What happened to them in the last seven years is what happened to the music industry, newspapers, magazines, book publishing, television. Millions of German people, farmers, especially farmers, and I'll get to this later, farmers, consumers, small and medium-sized enterprise, they came together and created electricity cooperatives. Farmers were the big ones. And what they did is they all got low-interest loans from the banks. At no government. The banks were happy to give the loans because they knew they'd be paying back by the premium they get for the energy they're producing and by the savings. Everyone got the loans. And they got paid back, and we now have a million buildings producing power. But go across Germany's farmland and you will see every farm is now a micro power plant, wind turbines as far as you can see, solar collectors everywhere, geothermal heat pumps. All over the farming in Germany, it's already there. Same in Denmark, which shows you can do it in a small, teeny country too. What happened to the big power companies? They're producing less than 7% of the new energy. We have democratized energy in Germany. Today, we have millions of people producing their own ele uh, green electricity. In 10 years from now, we'll have tens of millions. In 20 years from now, we'll have hundreds of millions. By the time you're my age, well before that, actually, the whole human race is going to be producing their own green electricity in the developing, developed world. The technology is there. Everyone has it. Everyone has the sun and the wind and the heat and the biomass or bioconversion and the hydro. This is going to happen because the curves are there. They're not going away. Does this mean the power companies go out of business? Now, I want the food industry to hear this because I'm showing models from other industries. Does this mean the power companies go out of business? No, they change their business model. They're not leaving the second industrial revolution tomorrow morning, the transmission companies, but they have to also be in this third industrial revolution so they can ease the transition over 20 years. So we introduced a new model. We said increasingly the people are going to produce the energy, just like we're democratizing entertainment, news, education, culture. And through our electricity cooperatives, starting with the farmers, they're the first in on this, and the consumers, we'll send the electricity back to the grid. You, the electricity company, you're going to erect and manage the energy Internet 
the way the Facebooks and the Twitters set up and manage the communication for the sharing. And the way you'll make money as a transmission company is by selling as little electricity as you can sell. You got, you heard that right. What you'll do as an electricity company is you will set up partnerships with thousands of businesses, food industry, manufacturers, small businesses, homeowners, and you will manage their data on their value chain as an electricity company. You will help those thousands of enterprises, profit and nonprofit, by managing their big data, using analytics, and creating algorithms for your clients so they can dramatically increase their efficiencies on their value chain, increase their productivity, and reduce their marginal cost. In return, those thousands of enterprises will share back their productivity with the electricity company. It's called performance contracts. There's more money in selling less electricity, managing the data, increasing the productivity of thousands and thousands of end users. Eon, five years ago, the chairman, Mr. Tyson, said, we're never going to do this. He did it three months ago. I'll see him this weekend in Germany. We're going to be meeting with the 65 leading CEOs. He's done it at Eon. ERDF and EDF have joined us in France. I sat down at Mr. Poglio's request at EDF. I sat down with Michelle Ballon, who's just retired. Her, her uh, successor was with me this morning. And we are doing the entire Nord Pau Calais area, my global team. It's 5 billion euros a year. We're moving to an Internet of Things platform in this old industrial region. ERDF joined us. EDF joined us. GDF Suez joined us. They're not leaving the second, but they want to move to the third industrial revolution. This is about business. Keep thinking the food industry. I'm going to get to it. The energy internet is now moving to China. The new premier uh, came into office. I, I didn't know him, and he, the first thing he did is put out his biography. I was shocked. He said he had read my last book, The Third Industrial Revolution, in his biography, and he instructed the central government to move on this plan for China. I've been there on two official visits with the government, met with the leadership, government and industry, and to show you how fast China's following Germany, after my first visit two years ago, the National Electricity Grid of China, the chairman, announced $82 billion four-year investment starting this year to lay out an energy internet across China so that everyone in China can produce their own solar and wind, send it back to the grid starting this year. They don't want to be stuck in the second industrial revolution. They missed most of it. They weren't even in the first industrial revolution. They want to lead along with Germany and the EU because this isn't just a German plan. This is our formal plan of the EU. The next step is France needs to join Germany. Together, they'll make this happen. The energy Internet makes possible the transport and logistics Internet. The, the automobile was the centerpiece of the second industrial revolution. We built the whole global economy around the automobile. The problem is... The millennials in this room have thrown us a curve, everybody here under 31. Because as soon as the transport and logistics Internet gave us GPS guidance, it allowed a younger generation to move from ownership to access to mobility. GPS guidance, transport and logistics. The millennial generation does not want to own a car. Grandma and Grandpa owned a car It sat in the driveway. The young people want access to mobility. They do not want ownership. And what you're seeing is car sharing taking off all over the world. Autolib's probably the best example because it's, I think, the most advanced, actually, but there are lots of systems coming into place. For every car shared, 15 cars are eliminated from production. Larry Burns was the former executive vice president of General Motors until five years ago. He just did a study. He said in a middle-sized city, Ann Arbor, Michigan, he's a professor at the University of Michigan, we can eliminate 80% of the vehicles now with the transport, logistics, GPS, Internet. We don't need it. The other 20% of the vehicles are going to be shared. They're going to be on GPS guidance. You call up on your smartphone, connects to the logistics, on a driver of a car, gets you within 90 seconds, you pay with PayPal. What I'm saying is, starting with the millennials here, 
Their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren will never own vehicles again. It's never going to happen. Not tomorrow morning, but you're going to see this quick transition from ownership to access. We have a billion vehicles in the world today, cars, buses, and trucks, choking us in traffic, the number three cause of climate change. We're going to eliminate 80% of those vehicles in the next 20 years, according to these studies. The other 200 million vehicles are going to be shared. They're going to be electric and fuel cell, like Autolib. They're going to be running on near zero marginal cost renewable energy produced across continents. They're going to be driverless within 10 years with no major labor marginal cost. Do you begin to see the implications for food, the implications for agriculture? How do we pay for this? And then we're going to talk about the food industry. The money is there. In Brussels, the question came up when I was meeting with the leadership the last several months, how do we pay for this? The money is there. In 2012, at the European Union, in the European Union, we spent $741 billion on infrastructure in 2012. Bad year, during a recession. Public and private monies. France, you spend money every year on infrastructure. Good years, bad years, every country does. The problem's not the money, it's where it's going. What we're doing is we're taking and building new old, new old. We're investing all that money in the second industrial revolution infrastructure of centralized telecommunication and with dumb servo mechanical electricity grids, mature fossil fuel and nuclear power, and very, very unproductive transport that's internal combustion on dumb road and rail. We've optimized the productivity of that platform. We cannot move any country on that platform anymore. If we simply reprioritize in every country our investment in infrastructure, for example, here in France, and spend maybe 25% of what we're going to spend anyway on the new infrastructure, the Internet of Things for a digital generation, the third industrial revolution, we're there in 25 years. Every industry will be engaged in this transition. If you, even the energy industry, GDF Suez is probably the most enlightened of the energy companies. Many of them are doing nothing. GDF Suez is there. But if you are a telecom company, a cable company, ICT company, electronics company, electricity transmission company, transport and logistics company, construction industry, life sciences, manufacturing, and especially the food industry, which I'll explain, you're going to be in this transition tomorrow morning. Because if you're not, you're going to be in a dying 20th century second industrial revolution within 10 years from now. I guarantee you. That's why Germany's moving forward quickly. China's moving forward quickly. California's moving quickly. The rest of the country, unfortunately, in my country, still thinks shale gas is the future in tar sands, and we're going to lose the generation. And I'm here to tell you, younger folks, you may see the United States as a second-tier nation if we don't get this quickly within 30 years. That's how fast this is moving. The industry engagement brings two generations back to work. I wrote a book in 1995 called The End of Work. You saw it here in France. I said, we're moving to automation. We're automating factory work. We did it. Now we're automating white-collar and service work. We're doing it. Now we're automating conceptual and knowledge workers. We don't need them. But in the short run, we have two generations left of one last surge of massive employment, only 40 years. We have to build out this infrastructure. It's going to require millions and millions of unskilled, skilled, and professional workers to build out the smart infrastructure. For example, in France, we have to move you, this country from fossil fuel and nuclear to renewable energy, distributed across the country. That means every single building in France has to be retrofitted. Every home, every office, every factory has to be insulated and made secure because if it leaks, you can't put the solar and wind on because all the energy is leaking. That keeps the construction industry busy for 40 years. In Nord-Pas-Calais, we are going to convert a million buildings in the next 20 years. 
That's just one region. So it's a huge operation to put in those renewables. Germany converts over a million buildings already, and they're producing power. Then in France, we have to take the entire electricity transmission grid of France and move it from dumb to smart and from servo-mechanical to digitalized. Who's going to put in all the underground cable? Who's going to put the advanced meters in every building? That's real workers. Robots aren't going to do that. We have to take the transport grid of France and move it from dumb to smart roads and from internal combustion to electric and fuel cell. We have to put in millions of charging stations. Every parking space has to have a charging station. So you can plug your car in, get electricity, or sell yours back. So we have the opportunity over 40 years to build this out, engage every industry in France, bring people back to work. But be clear that this automated capitalist market I'm talking about, once it's in, it's smart. It runs by analytics, big data, algorithms, and very small workforces. So where will the work go? Some people say, well, we'll just pay everyone not to work. Well, human beings are not going to do that. We are already seeing where the work will migrate. It's migrating already to the social economy, the sharing economy, because that's where we create social capital, environment, health care, senior citizens, assisted living, daycare, uh, cultural. All of these things require humans with humans. So in the long run, we're going to see a transformation. The machines are going to do the crap work so we don't waste every human life. And human beings are going to be more engaged in more sophisticated, deep play in the social economy. It's 10% of the employment already in my country already. It's 15% of the employment in some parts of Europe, including France. I think you're around 13% employment in the nonprofit sector. So this is what's before us. But now let me go to the food industry. No one will benefit more by the introduction of the Internet of Things platform than the farmers the food processors, the wholesalers, the retailers. Let me say agriculture is right up there among the most inefficient of our industrial sectors in terms of the value chain. Huge amounts of inefficiency. We're going to make a transition. Let me explain what I, what I think the, the issue here is and why we have to make the transition. The real reason I wrote this book, even though there's only a half a chapter on it, is what's really the problem here is your grandchildren may not be here. Honestly, I'm not trying to just scare you. We are in real-time climate change. We are not grasping the enormity of what's going on on this earth. We are totally asleep. I've been working on this issue since 1970s. Really, 1980, we started in, in earnest, but 1973 on energy. I thought this would happen over centuries. We never anticipated how fast this climate change would hit us because we couldn't model the feedback loops, and each feedback loop is, is giving us 10 more. And nowhere is the impact greater than in agriculture. What people have not yet grasped is climate change. People say, wow, it snowed today. There must not be getting warm. Look at the snow on the ground. It's huge. What we have never explained is that climate change changes the water cycles of the earth. And the big impact is agriculture. And if we can't feed the human race, we're dead. This is the watery planet. Our ecosystems are developed over millions of years based on the cloud coverings and the water exchanges across the earth. For every one degree that the temperature goes up from industrial climate change, the atmosphere is sucking up 7% more precipitation from the ground. The heat is forcing that precipitation from the ground to the atmosphere. We are getting more concentrated precipitation in the clouds. This is leading to more violent water events, more violent winter snows, more dramatic spring flooding across Central and Eastern Europe. More summer droughts. California's out of water. Pakistan's out of water. Sao Paulo's out of water. Have you been reading the papers every week? There's no more water. Droughts, floods, then droughts. We're getting Category 3, 4, and 5 hurricanes devastating low-lying countries. 
Our ecosystems cannot catch up with this runaway water cycle. And so they're being stressed to exhaustion. Our scientists tell us we're in the sixth extinction event. We had five extinction events of life on this planet 450 million years before human beings were here. And every time there was a turning point in the chemistry and a quick die out. And every time, 10 million years to get life back on Earth in the fossil record. We are now in the sixth extinction event. Our scientists tell us we may lose 70% of all forms of life by the end of this century. There are babies that will be alive in my age then. As my wife says, we're not grasping the enormity of this moment. 99.5% of all the species of life that have ever been on this little oasis called the Earth, 99.5% of all forms of life have come and gone. Here's our species. We're the youngest. We've been here 175,000 years, anatomically modern humans, and we think that there is no consequence to our actions. Agriculture is first hit. You've been watching California. We don't have any more water. This is happening all over the world, and we're getting the floods and the droughts. The interesting thing, nobody wants to talk about this, but I'm going to be blunt. Agriculture is one-third of all global warming. Nobody talks about it. We talk about buildings. We talk about transport. Agriculture is responsible for more global warming than transport in this planet, and nobody wants to talk about it, even Al Gore. So the irony is a lot of the global warming emissions is coming from our food and agricultural industries, and it's going to be the first victim of climate change. And if we can't feed the people, how the hell are we going to repopulate populations in the next 10, 20 years, not 50? So what's happening here with agriculture? First of all, we had mechanical agriculture of the first Industrial Revolution, the tractors, we then introduced chemical agriculture after World War II. That's all fossil fuels. So the chemical industry puts out the fertilizers and pesticides. They're made out of fossil fuels. So when the fertilizers are being made in the factories, they emit CO2. When you lay the chemical fertilizers down on the ground all over the world, they emit massive amounts of nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is 295 times more powerful than CO2. It's all over the world, chemical agriculture and the pesticides. Then we have a second problem. We have moved our agriculture from food to feed. 40% of the agricultural land in the world is now growing feed grain for beef cattle and other animals. Within 20 years, the projection is that 60% of the remaining agricultural land, which is now suffering from floods and droughts, is going to be feed grain. 40% left for the poor of the planet. So the wealthy can eat high up on the food chain. We, we die of diseases of affluence, heart attacks, strokes, type 2 diabetes. The poor die from diseases of poverty because they can't get access to the remaining land. It's too expensive for their food. And then the second problem is the shift from food to feed grain has allowed us to dramatically increase beef production. There's 1.3 billion cows on the planet. They take up 23% of the entire land mass of the earth. They emit massive methane. Methane is 23 times more potent than CO2 in the belching and in the manure. So we need to have a discussion about moving down the food chain. Remember I said agriculture is inefficient? The amount of grain you need for one pound of beef compared to the alternative, and that is using the protein, you get 10 times more protein at a fraction of the price in the legumes and vegetables. This is much more inefficient than transport of buildings. It's hard to hear this in France, I know. It's hard to hear this in a lot of countries. That's why Al Gore won't talk about it, but I'm going to tell you about it. We need to rethink our agricultural processes, and here's what I suggest we begin to do. This Internet of Things platform allows us to move to a sustainable agriculture, which will increase our productivity, reduce our marginal cost, replenish the land, and give us a hope that we'll address climate change. Number one. 
We've got to move out of chemical farming to organic ecological farming. Now, two weeks ago in Brussels, we had the life science industry there, and I said, look, we are subsidizing the farming and agricultural industry across the EU. Keep the subsidies, but change the priorities. Farmers would love to move to our organic food because they get premium for that price, and they know it's good for the land. But it takes seven years to keep the land fallow, to detox it. In other words, you can't certify organic in my country for seven years, so you can't use the land. We need to incentivize the food industry and the farmers and subsidize them so they can leave parts of their land fallow for seven years while they still produce in others and give them the incentive by subsidizing them to move off of chemical agriculture because the cost of the fertilizers and the pesticides, that's all fossil fuels. Those prices are going up. Go to ecological-based sustainable agriculture and the price of production goes down, the marginal and fixed cost. And you replenish the land. And you give the final end user products they'll want. But you've got to make it worthwhile for the farmers and the food industry. I'm for that. Incentivize the transition. Number two, every farm in France should be able to go on grid and go off grid and be self-sufficient in energy because the biggest cost outside of your fertilizers, your pesticides, it's your machinery. The machinery you have to use day in and day out on that farmland, your tractors, etc., is using a lot of fossil fuel energy. We're going to move to electric and fuel cell equipment on the farm. Every farm should have wind turbines and solar panels and thin film and geothermal heat pumps and bioconverters for methane for their cattle so that they can produce their own energy at near zero marginal cost. They can send some of it back to the grid and get premium. Every farm should be a power plant selling energy back to the grid after it uses energy it needs for the farm. Reduce your fixed and marginal cost. So we not only have to move from chemical to organic agriculture, which reduces the cost, we move to every farm being self-sufficient, being able to produce its own energy on site, near zero marginal cost. Number three, if you hook up to the Internet of Things platform, it means you can send your products to the warehouses and the wholesalers in electric and fuel cell vehicles powered by your own renewable energy to the processing. Electric and fuel cell vehicles, near zero marginal cost energy. Then the products can be shipped to the wholesalers and retailers in biodegradable plastic materials. And then with the end users, you're going to give them a product that's good for the land, good for their health, and good for their children's generation. This can be done tomorrow morning. We simply have to reprioritize the subsidies in Europe and put them all toward this transition over 20 years. If we don't do this, tell me how we're going to be able to provide food when we're seeing what's going on all over the world. I don't know if we're too late, but I do know this is the only plan, this Internet of Things platform, a third industrial revolution that can get us there in time, and here's why. Near zero marginal cost is the ultimate metric for reducing our carbon footprint. In other words, if, if, the farm, if the food industry and every other industry can use analytics and big data to create algorithms to dramatically increase their efficiencies and productivity at every step of their value chain, it means we're using less of the Earth's resources because we're using them more efficiently. So we don't need as much. Then if what we do produce at low marginal cost for the capitalist market or near zero marginal cost for the sharing economy, if it's shared, we share the homes, share the car, share the homes with Airbnb, share the cars with car sharing, share the clothes, the tools, the toys, more of us using less. We're in a circular economy. We're sharing. This can happen tomorrow morning. I've just been hearing about the sharing economy in food production. If you know about... Um, um, it, what is it called? Uh, Viz Eat here. Viz, Viz Eat here, I think it's called. In America, we have a new website that's called Eat With. And what's happening is they're following in the steps of Airbnb and Couchsurfing, and the kids are now creating 
apps and websites, it's going to take off, where if you are a, a local person and you want to be a chef, just like you open up your house, you open up your kitchen. So if people are traveling to your country and they're using Airbnb, maybe they can come to your house, you share your meals, you share your cooking, and you're on a website, this is already happening, where they can connect all the would-be chefs all over the world, they share their kitchen. They produce the food, so then as a traveler, you get to meet them, share the local cuisine, understand that food is a cultural statement, and have a very good journey. What it also means is for the person producing the food, it increases their reputation on the reputation sites. You say, hey, this is a good chef, meaning they can then go in the catering business or maybe become a chef in a restaurant because they've shown their worth on these systems. And we just talked about it. Some of the folks here this afternoon are creating these websites right now here in this room. And you can tie in nutrition with the nutritional industry connecting up with the local uh, kitchens of every apartment dweller, and everyone likes to be a chef. And you can have nutritional items on, let's say you want to cook for 30 people, and maybe some of them have a salt diet problem or they need less gluten. You can actually connect in with a website, start to do that, and show them how they can prepare the meals that are nutritious and also a good cultural shift. So the sharing economy is coming, but I would say this. It's a big transition, and the food industry really needs to be at the front and center stage. Last thought. The, I don't think any of this is easy. I'm not a wildlife optimist. I've always been guardedly hopeful, but I'm not naive. Anything can derail what I'm talking about. You have to have some luck in history. Sometimes a generation doesn't make it and doesn't come to the floor in time. Sometimes catastrophic events slow us up. Sometimes we just are lazy and we let it happen like the frog boiling in the pot of water. There are many civilizations, they just didn't have the stamina to move forward and save themselves. But now it's not about civilizations. It's about the biosphere of the earth. And I need to convince every parent and grandparent here, this is what we're talking about, and the millennials in this room. So here's France, and if you think about it, there are two countries that are recognized for cuisine and food in the world, France and Italy. If you want to take the two countries... These are the countries, when people think about cuisine and food and the good life, they think about France, they think about Italy. There's no doubt about it. These two countries should be at the front of this transition to an Internet of Things third industrial revolution and clean up agriculture, create the new opportunities for a sharing economy, create low marginal cost so that you can have a very vibrant capitalist market for your food products here and abroad. So the legacy that this generation in the food industry will leave is perhaps your grandchildren will say to you, thank you, because you turned it around and we were able to save this earth. Every human being not yet born, every other creature not yet born, they deserve their moment to experience the full flourishing of their being on this earth. The one thing I know at 70 years of age, I don't know any wisdom to impart on you except life is pretty interesting. Every day I get up and say, wow, what is this? I'm not sure what life is, but I know I want it every day. We have generations unborn, our fellow creatures including, they have a right to live in a replenished, healthy, sustainable, vibrant planet. It starts with food production. It starts with rethinking the basics of the food chain. Everything else will follow. Thank you. Jeremy Rifkin, bravo, merci pour uh, cet exposé uh, éblouissant. Donc on va vous donner un, un casque yeah. et donc... Uh, voilà, nous avons à peu près 10-15 minutes pour euh, prendre des questions. Je suis sûr que tout ce que vous avez pu dire aujourd'hui, en particulier euh, la nécessité de repenser euh, le processus agricole, je suis sûr que dans cette salle, euh, sera euh, suscité des réactions. Donc, euh, si vous voulez bien vous manifester en levant le, le doigt et on vous fournira un micro pour que vous puissiez poser votre question 
à Jérémy Rifkin. Madame, donc si on peut procurer un micro. Bonsoir et merci encore pour cette intervention. Je vais poser ma question en français, mon anglais n'est pas bon. Hein. Euh, J'ai beaucoup de questions. J'ai beaucoup de questions en, en tête, mais particulièrement, je voulais avoir votre point de vue. On, a, on assiste aussi à l'émergence de l'économie circulaire. Comment est-ce que vous l'intégrez par rapport à votre nouveau modèle économique euh, Comment tout ça peut, peut vous grandir ensemble Well, I mentioned the circular economy in the talk. The Internet of Things platform allows us at every stage of the value chain to aggregate our efficiencies and reduce our marginal costs so that we can use less of the Earth's resources more efficiently. That's part of the circular economy. Then, what we do produce in the capitalist market or in the sharing economy, it can all be re redistributed. We're doing this with our apartments now and our homes and our vehicles. We're starting to do this. Parents are now on websites sharing toys with their children. They're sharing tools and sporting equipment and clothes. And Nielsen just did a global survey of all the countries in the world, and this sharing economy is not going away. The younger you are, the more you share. That's the circular economy. Use less of the Earth's resources and share them over and over and over and over. Nothing goes to the landfill. Reduce our ecological footprint. So the Internet of Things platform increases the efficiency so we use less of the Earth's resources. Then what we do use at low to zero marginal cost is shared. Then if what we do is produce renewable energy at near zero marginal cost, that's ubiquitous. The sun is going to keep shining. The wind's going to keep blowing. So, and then if we move to transport, where we share the transport, we eliminate 80% of all the materials that go into transport. And if the vehicles we use are electric and fuel cell, we're off fossil fuels. This is all part of the sharing circular economy. J'ai une question ici sur ma gauche pour aller plus vite. Je vous cède le micro. Yes, uh, you didn't talk a lot about the finance industry. Uh, what do you think of the future of finance industry in uh, this scenario? And what do you think about the actual policies that are uh, followed by the central banks of the world? The, I think that the human race writ large lost faith in the banking system in 2008. And I have to say to you, I teach in the oldest business school in the world, the Wharton School, and I've taught generations of business leaders. Shameful. What we had here is literally corruption at the highest level in the financial industry around the world. They knew what they were doing. We were taken for a ride. And what I have to say to you is, and then we bailed them all out. Outrageous. We said they were too big to fail. The homeowners were too small to bring them back, but the banks were too big to fail. So I think there was a massive loss of trust in our banking and financial institutions. They're going to have to regain our trust. A younger generation said, you know what? We'll bypass them with crowdfunding. It seemed like something that would never work. It's just taken off. So now we're democratizing finance just like we democratized energy with renewables, democratized entertainment, news and knowledge. Crowdfunding's taken off. So if you have a project, you can go up on a crowdfunding site. You say, I need $500,000 within two weeks. And all over the world, people say, I'll give you five bucks. I'll give you 20 euros. Crowdfunding's taken off. It's still small compared to the banking industry, but it is growing at an exponential curve. We're going to need the banks. We're going to need the financial institutions. And what I say to them is this is their opportunity. I'll be with Deutsche Bank this weekend. This is their opportunity to not only to regain the trust, but to actually, should I say, bring the financial industry back to health. Because we're going to have to have them invest in the infrastructure build-out in every region of the world. The banking industry has all this money. They don't know what to do with it. That's why we are giving out loans at negative interest rates <laughs> because they don't know what to do with the money. The problem is that second industrial revolution platform, there's no, there's no returns in it. It's exhausted. It's aggregate efficiency leveled off at 13%. So if they invest in the new infrastructure, immediately returns on investment. Energy savings, 
new productivity, more people at work, engagement of new businesses. So there's a huge opportunity for the banking and financial industry and the institutional funds in every community and region of France and around the world to join. In NordPat Calais, the build-out we're doing there now, and we've involved uh, ERDF and EDF and Bouygues and a lot of the French companies there, they have one thing they put in place where, uh, with one of the national banks in France, where they can take your savings account, it's a national bank in France, and you can take your savings account and the interest, and you can earmark it so it goes to an infrastructure investment for the third industrial revolution in Nord Pas Calais. You still get the same interest back. People are signing up all over the place. But every region should be able to do that. Burgundy and every other region. So I think that the banking industry, I'm seeing lots of good intentions by a younger generation of bankers. They want to make good and regain the social trust, but also they see the business opportunity here is enormous. Une question dans le fond de la salle. Good evening, Jerry. I'm Arthur from WeShare. Uh, Just here, at here the back. Uh, I have a question. You, you may be aware that last week a report made by an independent research uh, institute in France, uh, it, it leaked. Actually, the French government did not reveal it. But the, the revelation was quite shocking because what they said was it would not be much more expensive to have the kind of distributed, decentralized, uh, renewable energy infrastructure that you talk about. Are you talking about ENA or ANEL? Uh, about the ADEM, yes. You know, ANEL, yes, my sustaining... European director who's from Italy told me this just happened a couple of days ago. Yeah. Finally. I've been working on those guys for 10 years. Yeah, I know. That's so, good. But you may be aware of the fact that it would not cost much more than just to sustain the nuclear industry. Yeah, we're in France, so we love the nuclear industry. We're not too much into shell gas. But my question was, how do you overcome such vested interests, especially when they are state-backed as a council of several governments? <clears throat> the, the bottom line is the technology is on an exponential curve. So what's happening with power companies like ERDF and EDF and Eon and now Enel, they, they see the curve now. There's no way to escape it. The only way to escape it is to outlaw all the technology of the third industrial revolution won't happen. They're going to quickly move to the model that we've designed. Absolutely. Enel's going to start doing it now. I had discussions with Mr. Conti when he's there for years. The chairman of the board was for us, but Mr. Conti wasn't. He's retired. They're going to move. Everyone's going to move to this. Now, ERDF and EDF, they're not going to leave the second industrial revolution tomorrow morning. This is a 30-year transition, but they are really going to head into the third industrial revolution, too. That's smart business. And the bottom line is you can't compete with near-zero marginal cost energy that's ubiquitous. How does coal and shale gas and tar sands and big nuclear power plants compete with the sun? 45 minutes of sunlight powers the world seven times over for an entire year. 20% of the wind harness gives us seven times more power than the planet's human race will ever need. You cannot compete with the sun and the wind and the geothermal heat and the bioconversion and the hydro. It's really over. So I'm, I do believe the technology is scaling us there. My biggest concern... And I'm glad that GDF Suez seems to be at the front with the energy companies. Some like Exxon, they'll never get it. GDF Suez is moving this way. But what's going to happen here is the other industries are now seeing the possibilities. I was with MEDEF yesterday in Paris at their annual meeting. We had the presidents of all the major associations in the room, of all of France. And what I said is, why would you not be there side by side with Germany? France, like Germany, has the world-class industries to make this happen. You are world-class in telecom, world-class in cable, world-class in electricity transmission, world-class in ICT and consumer electronics, world-class in transport, logistics, construction, world-class in manufacturing and in food production, and tell me you don't want to join the third industrial revolution and create the new model with Germany. I think it's going to burst through in France. I think in the next 12 months, the business community is going to come together and say to the government, we want every region of France to move on a roadmap, put down this infrastructure. It should not just be in Nord Calais. 
one industrial region. It should be across France. And when France joins Germany, the EU will move this forward with China. It's going to be France and Germany moving the EU and the industries here and then joining China for a Eurasia Silk Road, which we're talking about from Shanghai to Ireland, one big market. We're 66% of the human race by mid-century. No more geopolitics share on a common integrated grid across Eurasia. France now has to step up with Germany, and I believe that's going to happen in the next 12 months. Une question ou deux, peut-être, avant de clore cette session. Sur ma gauche, je vous donne le micro pour aller plus vite. Merci. Euh, question en français. Euh, quand on partait en vacances, quand on était enfant sur le bord de, de la mer, notre pare-brise de voiture était plein d'insectes. Vous avez dit tout à l'heure qu'il fallait privilégier euh, l'agriculture biologique. Aujourd'hui, donc, il y a des produits assez dangereux pour les abeilles, notamment. Euh, il y a un mois, justement, le Sénat, le Sénat français a rejeté l'interdiction de ces produits. Comment faire My wife and I have a farm in Virginia. It's just for haying. It's a wildlife refuge, but it's a farm, and we hay. We're, everybody's frightened about what's happened to the bees. Really frightened. Uh, the food industry's got to step forward. We need a new generation of leaders in the food industry, and they've got to move from little statements about sustainability, which is just PR, to understanding if we transform the food industry, it sets the basis for every industry. Everything is sets atop the food industry. It's the beginning. You have to have food. Then you can have manufacturing. Then you can have services. Then you can have the Internet of Things platform. We need a generation of leaders in the food industry that can say we need to clean it up, transform it, so we can be more productive, more efficient, put out cleaner foods and healthier foods, and we save the earth from climate change so we can produce food for the future. The food industry leaders have to come to the fore, and instead of being defensive and passive, they have to be forward-thinking and visionary because the technology is here. It just needs to be scaled. This isn't rocket science. Everything I've said this afternoon is being done somewhere in scaling. It needs to be France because... People recognize the French food industry as the food industry for the world, along with Italy. These two countries have to move this forward. Maybe um, a last question, or I may ask you the last question. Uh, you've got access to head of states, head of governments, big institutions. Do you feel that there is a, a shift of mood amongst politicians that what you say about the sharing economy, the third revolution, third industrial revolution. Do you feel that at, at last it's taken seriously or are they still a bit uh, skeptical about it? You all have a memorandum. Did, did, did they put a memorandum on the Digital Europe memorandum that I developed in your... That memorandum that I did, it's in English, translated to French. I did that for President Juncker. I met with his vice president's commission and the leaders of the parliament. And Mr. Juncker said, wrote back, and he said, I've read every word of every sentence over and over. This is where we want to go. And I've met with the leadership there. We've had a lot of meetings. And you're going to see a new journey in the EU called Digital Europe starting this spring. That memorandum captures most of it. All right? The EU has always had to have a new vision to bring it forward or it falls back. So we had the coal and steel community, France and Germany, France led. We had the Euratom project, France led, France and Germany. We had the common market, France led with Germany. Then we had Maastricht and we created a political union, France and Germany. Then we had the euro and we created a monetary union, France and Germany did that. Then we moved forward with the extension to 28 member states, France and Germany did that. Now we're in limbo. We need a new journey, and the new journey is digital Europe, the Internet of Things platform, the coming together of communication, energy, transport, and logistics internet, so we create one integrated platform across all of Europe and the partnership regions. We have a billion people here, 500 million in the Union, 
500 million in the partnership regions in the Mediterranean, North Africa. It's the biggest market in the world. Digital Europe, the new journey. This is going to allow us to create one technology platform across a billion person market so we can dramatically increase our efficiencies, reduce our marginal costs, be competitive in a global capitalist market, and at the same time introduce a sharing economy. So this can be done. So read that memorandum. That memorandum went to the eyes of Mr. Juncker, the vice president of the commission, the heads of the parliament. It's open source. You read it. And then if you think it makes sense, pass it on across the food industry. Let's make the food industry right up front be the leaders of this revolution here in France tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Good night, everybody. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Jeremy Rifkin. Et je vous rappelle donc qu'il y a une petite séquence de signature de livres, de dédicaces sur la scène.